Hey, hi everyone. I, I realize that I'm standing between you and the rest of your evening, so I'm going to try not to bore you to death. Um, and I want to tell you a story. It's a story about a problem that I needed to get fixed about 10 years ago, uh, and how we attempted to fix that problem using open source. Um, we're going to talk about friends, or rather lessons, that we learned along the way, um, and also how we ended up by flipping the problem that we had upside down. So who are we? I'm alone here. Uh, I should be with Seb, but he couldn't make it today. Uh, my name is Tom. I'm uh, the creator and core developer of Yeti, which is a thread intel platform which I'm going to talk about extensively during the next 30 minutes. Um, Yeti started when I was working at CERT Société Générale, which is a financial institution in France. Uh, now I'm doing digital forensics and incident response at Google. I've always been an incident responder. Uh, Seb is working at, as a security researcher at OSUI, which is a French engineering school in Paris, and he's doing um, research and teaching there. So as incident responders, uh, most of the talks that we've seen today about CTI revolved around detection and, and pivoting and so on. We have a very forensic approach, and at least when Yeti was created, it was really, really having this, you know, what the fuck am I looking at? Like, I'm looking at a disk. I need to figure out what's happening. I'm looking at a sample. I don't know. I don't know what the sample is about. Is it good? Is it bad? And as an instant responder, I need to make that decision quickly, right? So reverse engineering, very hard. No one has time for this. Looking at all the bytes, it's really terrible, especially IR. IR wants to get answers very quickly so they can move on with the investigation. And when you don't have a dedicated threat intelligence team that is going to reverse engineer all those samples for you, then you have to do what you can best. So the next best thing was networking indicators. Much better, much easier to collect. People send them all the time in emails. You get them from MISP. It's very easy. And it's also easy to search for. You just need TCP dump, a good set of packet filters, and then you just need to run your sample in a sandbox. Or even if you're dealing with an infected system, you can just put your system behind a sniffer, extract all the network indicators, and then search in your knowledge base. And because I'm a nerd and I love to code, I came up with something called Malcolm. This was very, very old. Presented it in 2013 at BotConf. Uh, Malcolm was a way to just visualize uh, network traffic for uh, VMs that were, that were running samples. So that was one thing. The other thing was a thread feed ingester. So we've been talking about feeds a lot uh, these days. Uh, but any, any feed that you could think of, this would get ingested, normalized, and parsed by Malcolm, and it would get stored. So what you ended up having was a live network capture. So this was a very simple API, insane amounts of JavaScript. What was I thinking? I don't know. Um, but it ended up having, this result was an over-engineering piece of work that could allow you to fancily visualize things uh, and really put out badness in the midst of all the network traffic that you were seeing. So... It worked okay, uh, but in the end, we thought it would be better to take a step back because we, we had to have a way to store these indicators and to sort of make sense of what were like the fa malware families that we were tracking the most, what were we seeing the most, what kind of compromises were we responding to the most. So I said, okay, let's, let's take a step back and start from scratch. This was me in 2014. And this is how I came up with Yeti back then. And Yeti is a thread intel platform, open source, one, one, man shop behind behind everything. And it divided the concept between observables, indicators, and entities. And observables are going to be your IP addresses, URLs, hashes, what have you. Indicators are going to be more regular expressions or Yara rules that you can search for in your systems. And entities are going to be the malware, the threat actors, the campaigns as you're tracking. We were using tags everywhere. So we could tag observables, we could tag entities. And if you tagged an observable that had the same tag as an entity, then a link between those would be created. And indicators could also go through observables, uh, trying to find pattern and doing pattern matching. And they would also link observables to entities if they found a match. Uh, we're using Python, JavaScript, again, Bootstrap CSS, that made things way easier. MongoDB, uh, which will be a problem down the line, as we'll see later. Uh, it was a great database, uh, and Redis for everything that was asynchronous and synchronization and so on. But I still wanted to make it a thread intel platform that was oriented towards DFIR practitioners. So the idea was to say, I have a bunch of indicators, just shove it in the platform and tell me what you know. Um, we have a few screenshots of what looks to be a very old-looking interface. 
Um, we can see all the feeds there. So we have stuff like block, block list DE, alien vaults, IP reputation. We had a bunch of analytics, uh, some in-house internal cleanup things, domain tools, virus total, uh, passive DNS from Circle, and so on. You would put in your API key, and you could like have the IP get expanded or get other observables created from that IP address and, and associated to the initial observables. And this is what the entities page looked like. So a bunch of malware there being tracked by, by Seb. The indicators, believe it or not, what you see in red are, are just Yara rules that were stripped of their new lines. So they're impossible to read. But trust me, when you clicked on the details page, it was a little better. So as you can see, this was very hacky, uh, but it still did the job pretty well. We also had an investigation view, which was the view that we used when we wanted to regroup all these indicators, entities, and observables around a common investigation or campaign. And this was associated to our in-house ticketing system called FIR back at the bank. All right, so fast forward a few years. Uh, what happened in the meantime? This was in 2014. So MIST, MIST started becoming the golden standard for CDI sharing. Uh, this is of no surprise to anyone here, I think. Commercial vendors start entering the game of CTI, and they start like selling things and feeds and so on. 2017, the first version of Sticks 2 comes out. I'm not sure about the dates here. I, I did my best to research them, giving on, on GitHub graph commits and so on. End of 2016, start of 2017, we see stuff like what the, the people behind the Hive were doing, like Ipocomp and Cortex, which were also sort of feed ingestion and analytics and so on. January 2018, MITRE publishes Attack, the first version, according to their website, what I could find. Um, late 2018, we see the first commits happening for OpenCTI. So these are all things that were really close to the concepts that we were developing. So on one side, it shows that we were like on the right track. Uh, and obviously, it's a very interesting field that, you know, there's a real need for people to have this kind of information, you know, in a more structured way, in a more professional way than just two nerds hacking at this in their garage. So in the meantime, for Yeti, um, we had few significant external contributions. Um, some people contributed stuff. Um, like very changes to the core of Yeti, which made it harder to maintain because they weren't sometimes of the highest quality. Uh, the core developers had competing priorities. I was changing jobs. Um, we had licensing problems as well. Uh, my new job could not accept anything running, anything that is licensed AGPL, and MongoDB is licensed AGPL, so this was a no-go for us, which also meant that the code base started to rot because we would never develop on it. Um, all the dependencies that uh, Yeti was using were getting deprecated, or also those maintainers stopped working on them. So it was it was a little painful. Um, and at some point in 2018, uh, me and Gael Müller, who, who worked a little bit on Yeti as well, decided to come up with Tibet, Tibetan Brown Bear, which was like a, an intermediate rewrite of sorts. But it turns out that some people, according to Seb, were still using Yeti. So there was still like, some people liked at least the workflow that, that we could offer. So it's like, OK, let's start from scratch again. <laughs> Four years later, no lessons learned. But no, not completely. So what lessons did we learn in these four years? We're a two-man shop, three-person three shop, so we can't do everything. We can't possibly compete with the scale at which MIS operates or which OpenCTI operates. So we want to do less things, and we want to do them a little better. We also don't want to anticipate any use cases we don't have. Like if you want to use SAML authentication, which is really, really far from doing any kind of CTI, then you're free to do it, but you're free to implement it yourself. The code base, the first Yeti, was very elegant. It wasn't, but we're privileging like simple and clear code this time around, which makes it very easy for anyone to dig in to the code base. And also for us, if we're taking like a two months hiatus on developing, then we don't have to come back to a code base that's completely unfamiliar to us, and we can just start hacking away again. And you know, as I started working for Google, I also learned a lot of new concepts that I had no idea about, about code, like code smell, tech depth, code churn, toil, all these things that were you know, making me think twice as soon as I wanted to implement any kind of new feature. Testing, I know it's super unsexy, but it was really a lifesaver in these past few weeks when we had to like commit, 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 and you know merge changes. And we could do so with confidence that things were going to work out. But there's also some new changes uh, that are coming to Yeti. So this time we're going full Apache 2.0, licensing everywhere. 
we're using ArangoDB, which is a database that is also licensed, Apache 2.0, and it's a graph database. And we're fully embracing, also experimenting a little bit with, with the graph capabilities of Arango. We're still using Redis. We're still using tags. This worked very well the first time around, so this is really something that we want to keep using. We're using a very modern version of Python, 3.10. I know that now Python is releasing a lot of versions all the time, and it's very hard to keep track of them because there's breaking changes. 3.10 is what we're up to, but we're happy to move. We're using Fast API, Fast API and Pydantic, which are two great Python libraries if you want to create new services that are going to have an API. Highly recommended. Uh, we'll talk more about this later. And the front end, yes, still JavaScript once more. I never learn. Um, our data model is based on Stix2, because Stix2 has got things figured out pretty well, but it's not really Stix2, so it's inspired from Stix2. Uh, Tibet and Brown Bear was entirely compliant with Stix2, but that gave us a lot of headaches that you know we decided to avoid this time around. Uh, it's still very easy to import like Miter attack libraries uh, or MIPS, MIPS galaxies. You just have to write a feed for them. And this time we want to support a little more indicator types like Yara, Sigma, generic queries, and we want to stay vendor agnostic. So um, I know CSVs aren't the best way to export threat intelligence, but sometimes all you want is a CSV and that works for you, that's perfect. Fast API and Pydantic, really good. Um, there's like strict data model validation. They serialize everything to JSON. The API is self-documenting. This page was generated by the libraries, uh, and it also allows you to generate clients, like in Python, Golang, TypeScript, and so on. So that's pretty powerful, and it's saving us a bunch of times and saving us from a lot of mistakes. There's a shiny new... UI in Vue.js. Uh, this is really just shinier than the one before, but we're keeping the same concepts. Uh, we have the same kind of analytics, so feature-wise, we're trying to stay the same, but we're focusing a lot of graphs. As I said, there's like two main graphs in Zeti. One is a threat graph, which is going to map entities to indicators or entities between themselves as well. So for example, you can say APT28 uses XAgent OSX, and the YAR will detect XAgent OSX. So all this is going to create a graph. Uh, but you can also associate observables with entities, whether they're malwares, groups, whatever, through tags. So this is way more flexible, and it allows you also to track how these things are associated to each other over time, which is pretty interesting. And I hear you say, like, wait, didn't you say it was about forensics and incident response? And all I've talked about so far was just a, a less good version of all the CTI software that you already know and use. And that's true, right? So. If we come back to the same origin question, what am I looking at? This is going to help answer what is bad on my disk. But I also want to know what should I be looking at. I want, I want these tools to help me orient a little bit my investigation. So I want my tools to tell me where to look at. Like, where's the malware? Yes, sure, that works. But also, where do I see lateral movements in the logs that I have? Where do I see persistence? Where are all the binaries on my disk? Show me all the binaries on my disk. And if I tell my Thread Intel team to look at my disk and show me all the binaries, they're going to be like, what? what do you mean with all the binaries? Don't you want only the malicious ones? And I'm like, no, I want all the binaries. And why, why is that? So I came up with this analogy two hours ago. Um, but imagine that you're... You know, you're a lab technician, forensic lab technician, and then this body comes in and they have a knife in their chest. And then the cyber threat intel analyst is going to come up and say, yep, it's a knife. You're like, cool, but that, that doesn't really help. But to give a more realistic thing, it's more like the body comes in and I'm like, okay, let me extract some blood from the body, send it to the lab, and then the threat intel analysts are going to run their Yara rules on the blood. And they're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's polonium or something. Yeah, so this gives me a good idea of how to conduct my investigation. But what happens when the body comes in and the, the YAR rules don't match the blood that I sent to the lab? And the threat intel team is like, I don't know, man, just deal with it. So I want to have a system that tells me how to look at my data. And I want to start using more non-malicious indicators. I want classification rules. I want a Yara rule that tells me, oh, these are all the SQLite databases that are on your system. These are all the binaries that are on your system. I want something that tells me, just show me all the log lines that contain an IP address. Or that tells me, well, this is all the run keys that can be used for you know, execution of artifacts. And there's a lot of projects that are doing similar things already. There's Hasher, which is developed by a coworker of mine, which basically takes disk images, which are supposed to be base images of disks, 
and just hashes them and exports them to a Postgres database. And, and this is very cool. And it, we're working, we're trying to work with, uh, with the folks at Circle who look, do hash lookup because it's very, it's very useful to detect what's, what's a good baseline of things. There's also all the lol bass, lol bins, lol drivers, GTFO bins. These people have a great sense of humor. Um, and all these, they, they reference good things or things that are legit but can be misused. There's also forensics artifacts. There's DFIQ.org, which is another project that our team started about orienting investigations and structuring them and having different approaches to things. So a forensic artifact is going to literally be a YAML file that is going to tell you, like, well, here are all the Windows run keys. And this, for me, as a forensic analyst, is very useful because I just have to search for Windows run keys. And it just deals with, you know, looking for things for me. It just tells me what are the evidences. Browser history, compounded artifacts. This is already available at forensicartifacts.com. It is, in fact, what GUR uses when you tell GUR, which is like our, our endpoint forensic system, um, to say like, oh, we want, we want browsing history. And GUR is going to just figure things out and give us whatever files it can find that match this. Super useful, great gain of time. And this allows you to do cool com combos. Like, if you only have execution artifacts by themselves, that's not super interesting, or it could be. But if you combine them with like, oh, show me all the execution artifacts that also have a base64 blob, then it turns out to surface bad things. Show me all the low bass executions that you know that also happen to have a domain or an IP address in the line, because that's not something that we, you know, might want to see. Show me all the file creation system events on the timeline, and filter them, and show me all the elves that are there, and then filter out the known good. I can assure you, in 80% of cases, you will find bad stuff if you do this. Show me all the SSH login events that I see and filter out all the good IPs that I know of that are in my network. All these combinations are a way to slice and dice data. And this is really one of what, what I want Yeti to become, is like this store of forensic intelligence that it can provide to analysts who are looking for ways to see their, their data that it makes more sense than just a bunch of logs that they have to go through. Um, we already have some time sketch analyzers. Time sketch is our open source uh, timeline analysis tool, uh, which we've been working a lot on recently. There's a new UI as well. Um, we can also send all these classifications, Yara, to Turbinia or Plazo, uh, which is going to parse insane amounts of disks and is going to tell me, like, yep, here are all your ELF files. Here are all your SQL databases. The idea is to be able to store, share, improve, and also iterate upon the useful queries. Like, I want. Imagine if my company acquired a big incident response firm and they told us like, oh yeah, cool, what, what kind of like queries are you using on GCP to find logs? And I'm like, well, they're hanging out in my, on a text file on my desktop somewhere. We can do better than this and we can share this a little better. And having DFIQ also allows us to bring a lot of good structure to these uh, queries and to this information. So this is really the idea. The roadmap so far is to have better DFIQ integration and Turbinia integration, uh, to visualize uh, the graph connections better using tables or even graphs, uh, but to just actually make use of all these rich connections that we have. Um, we're thinking of doing dynamic artifact generation, like if you just add a bunch of observables and tag them as persistence, maybe you can just generate an artifact that is going to regroup those. So other systems that can use that format just can ingest that. Uh, integrations with other platforms uh, like MISP and so on. We're also counting a lot on the community for this. Um, Suricata rule, validation, Python clients. We're also working or thinking of working on documentation. I know this is not the most exciting part of the project, but yes, also migration scripts for people who are using the first versions of Yeti. Um, and we have an official release plan by end of month, uh, but you can start playing it with it now. We have a Docker Compose container that will just get you up and running in a few seconds or minutes, depending on how, how strong your machine is. Uh, but it's really easy to use and deploy. So the basic, basically takeaways of this talk, I don't know if I sped up through it. Um, Yeti is trying to move from a CTI platform to a DFI platform or a digital forensics intelligence platform. It's an automated, reusable forensics knowledge base in a way. And the idea is really to help analysts give them tips and ways to slice and dice data so they can really make sense of the insane amounts of logs that they have to look at every day when they do uh, things. And also main takeaway is that I can't help it and I just like rewriting software that I wrote years ago. All right, that's, that's it for me. I 
think we have questions, maybe. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Test, test. Ooh. <laughs> all right. I love this. This was like the best presentation I saw all day. Maybe. I don't know. It is the end of the day. You just got Good here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so as it happens, I did the first proof of concept implementation at Splunk for OpenIOC, whatever it was, 1.1 and Sticks 1 back in the day, as well as some other crap. And... Uh, I can show you on the doll where Cybox hurt me, and probably my marriage might have survived too if it weren't for Cybox. So I was like, this is important crap, and I'm going to try to pay it forward for the next guy. So I was, until, I mean, I can't take credit for everything, but I did work really crap and hard for Styx too. I was the co-chair for many years of Cybox and Styx, and like it discouraged the crap out of me, to be quite honest, for years. That's been like six, seven years since we've released that. I mean, Jiminy Christmas. I almost went bankrupt after we released that. Like, it was just this, like, valley of nothing in CTI. And it's so heartening to see this sort of ecosystem starting to spring up. Like, I didn't really see it. I mean, I, of course, knew about Minor Attack and all this stuff. But it was that was a great slide. So you made my day. Really, you did. Thank you. So... Informed by that context, and I am going to wrap up then, because it is a question, sort of <laughs> suggestion. It's an invitation. Because if you go like one slide back where you were saying, like, huh, integrations. Sorry, there we go. There we go. So, like, when I was, <laughs> integrations need to die, really. That was between us, like, the whole master plan with Sticks 2 and Taxi, which, you know, that's a little bit more wobbly, but that's okay. It was to sort of get the camel's nose. and Do we say that? To say camel's nose inside of a tent? I don't know if that's... You know what I mean. It was to sort of sneak in a sort of an interoperable bus for security shit. And so, like, in light of that, the point is, like, the people who care in security with Clue who can code are finite. And their resources should not be focused on ETL when you have product version here and product version here, and you've got to do an ETL every time it changes. That was the whole idea of sticks. And everybody was like, rah, 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 threat butt, threat butt, CTI. So it's like, let's jam some interoperable open interface in there and break up these silos. So what I say to you is that thing about like sharing forensic insights or like here are questions to ask your data. Oh, you've got this piece, you might well also get this piece. But here's some interesting questions. That's going in a really cool direction. Don't do this with integrations. Let's have a sidebar and figure out if there's some way that we can put that in a data model and submit it as an extension for sticks. Because that's a way more powerful use of your time and your team's time is to standardize that and get it field tested. You know what I'm saying? And then we can apply market pressure to other people who maybe already implemented sticks too. And now they just need to implement the additive bit. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That was the master plan. And like, let's kill the integrations and let's use the pipe that's hopefully there. Thanks. That was awesome. Sure. Thanks. Okay, great. Any other questions? No more questions. Okay. Then we cool. thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for bearing with me until the end. <laughs>